So I, for, before I get back to the uh, topic I was uh, sharing with you last week, uh, just in terms of the meditation we've done today, anything you've heard, is, is everything, anything not clear? Any experiences you're having or how to handle it or what to do or what this kind of meditation is about? Is, I mean, is anything not, any questions, I should say? Good. I take it everyone is an accomplished meditator. Wonderful. Uh, so, how many people were not here last week? Oh, okay. I mean, and also they didn't listen to the talk afterwards or anything. Oh. Well, you'll you'll you'll, you'll be held after school today. For <laughs> I just want to know how much. Uh, so again, uh, I'll, I'll review a little bit, but I can't review too much because there are people online and here who, who were here last week. So again, all the talks are recorded. Uh, so if you want to fill in the blanks, uh, please do. But basically, in my last uh, two or three talks, uh, sort of been going in a certain direction. The first direction was sharing uh, kind of old Buddhist teachings on kind of, uh, we might call it the degeneration of Buddhism since the time of the Buddha. Uh, you know, Buddhists uh, have a, have a uh, understanding of uh, the phenomenal world that it, uh, you know, like a thought, like a person, like, a, like everything. Everything comes into being, it exists, it spends time existing, and then it uh, deteriorates. And that just sort of, and then it's, kind of continues on in different forms. I mean, that's basically the, the Buddhist universe is a very uh, wide open, but always, uh, you know, moving in this direction. Nothing, nothing is permanent, nothing is stable. So uh, many of the ancients uh, saw that the Buddhism, uh, and, and not only just Buddhism, but the whole world system would degenerate over time. I mean, uh, which means what? It's interesting, and I shared a lot of these so-called prophecies uh, written a thousand, two thousand years ago, and they basically describe our times. They, they, des they described, you know, and I won't go into how they knew, <laughs> but, but they basically uh, describe human beings as just becoming sort of the, the, our minds becoming uh, sort of heavier, to put it one way, and just social relations becoming more and more difficult, uh, just more and more uh, unethical living. Uh, you know, at, at, at all levels of society, uh, just more conflict, more strife, uh, which would be reflected not only in a world of conflict and strife, but also uh, very clearly would spill out into the natural world. There'd be all kinds of natural disasters, et cetera, et cetera. Very, you know, difficult time, as well as, in terms of Buddhism, people's capacity to practice will also be much less than the ancient. And as I think I pointed out last week, I mean, many of us just have difficulty even just quieting our minds or, or you know, finding time to meditate, right? So it shows you this is a, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult time to be alive and a difficult time for those following a spiritual path and wanting transformation, wanting an open heart, wanting an open mind, you know, wanting, you know, intelligence and wisdom in this world. It's just difficult to kind of find that place within ourselves and maintain it over time. So uh, what, what I got into last week was sharing this uh, very interesting fifth teaching from a Tibetan teacher uh, from the 50s, who, uh, as I said, uh, lived in Tibet. This was the early 50s. Uh, Chinese communists were coming in. Um, and he saw, even though in the early days, uh, the communists were very um, more like white gloved, beginning to control, control things, but didn't come down heavy. They didn't really come down heavy till about 58. Uh, but uh, Kempo Gangsha saw, he saw, uh, you know, that Buddhism was going to be destroyed in Tibet. The monastery is going to be destroyed. The, the, the monastic community was going to be uh, destroyed. Teachers were going to be arrested. I mean, he kind of saw it all. So he, he, he realized the outer forms of Buddhism 
if that's all Buddhism is about, will end. But that the inner forms of Buddhism, which means the, you know, the, the real practices and the understanding, if, if people have internalized those, Buddhism will, will, will continue to be available in the world. So he, uh, he very uh, diligently uh, taught what, what used to be higher teachings uh, to everyone, everyone. You know, peasants, nomads, anybody who would listen. He, as I said last week, he, he, called, the, uh, he called all the, the hermits and the yogis out of the hills, come down. You can't stay in retreat anymore. We, 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 we have to really, uh, you know, bring the teachings into, into the lives of people because all these outer institutions and even the ability to practice outwardly, uh, you know, may, may not exist. So uh, he, he eventually was arrested and uh, he, he died in prison. As, as many of the, uh, the higher teachers did. And there's not much, um, there are only a few things uh, that he wrote. So this is called, uh, and I'm reading from a book called uh, Vivid Awareness, The Mind Instructions of Kempo Gangshar, and written by uh, Kenshin Drung, Drungu, who actually uh, was able to take teachings from him uh, when, when he was a young monk in Tibet. So he actually met him and was very deeply affected by him and actually heard him give these teachings. And so this is a book uh, based on uh, this text, which I'm not going to go all through, and, um, and um, comments on that. So um, there's a lot here, but it's short and simple. So I'll just pick out a few things. I've, I've often used these when people go on solitary retreat other times because some of these are quite profound. Uh, so let me just say, um, in our community, for those who aren't familiar, we have three paths of practice, what we call the mindful living path, the Dharma path, the wisdom path. Uh, so this, our first path, the mindful living path, is not a traditional Buddhist path. <laughs> uh, it's something that we have extrapolated for, for Americans because we notice that for many people, before they can really begin to seriously practice a spiritual path, they get, they, we, we have some work to do. And, and one of the things we need to learn to do is how to be present and mindful. <laughs> you know, not to, not to be all over the place with our minds. I mean, how to be, be present to each other, to the people in our life and who we work with. You know, so, you know, just to be able to, to, to enjoy walking, enjoy being in nature, you know what I mean? Just mindful living, number one. And number two is emotional healing. I mean, there are many, many people uh, these days, we have all kinds of emotional issues, wounds, which just, which prevent us from really, any, with any kind of uh, consistency following a spiritual path. We're always kind of sabotaged by our, our reactivity, our emotionality. So we've added what we call the mindful living path. But then after that is the Dharma path and the wisdom path. And this is really uh, what he gets into. The first section is called the general preliminaries. And I talked a little bit about those last time. Uh, but, but quite simply, before one sort of begins the meditative path in traditionally, uh, well, as I say, we, we, we added the mindful living path, but also even those entering, quote unquote, the Dharma path, the, the practices and teachings. The Dharma is the practices, teachings of the Buddha. Uh, one, would do, one would have some preliminary, some, have to have some foundation before one uh, enters a, a meditative path. And one of these is at least some understanding of what's going on in this life. Various things like impermanence, law of cause and effect, uh, you know, th things like that, the preciousness of life and the opportunities that we've been given having a, having a human birth. So there are a number of kind of preliminary things or just understanding uh, kind of that a, that a superficial life devoted to uh, just pleasure seeking or gain, uh, avoiding loss, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is fundamentally unsatisfactory. So it's called, it's, that teaching is really all about the fundamental unsatisfactoriness of a worldly life, which is the life we all participate in, by the way. It's fundamentally unsatisfactory because they cannot give us the happiness and the peace of mind 
that we seek. Everything it can give us is only temporary. It can give us temporary happiness when things go our way, but it will give us temporary unhappiness when things don't go our way. So anyhow, so that's, so, so meditating, reflecting on these things uh, is first. Uh, another thing is what they call arousing bodhicitta, which is aspiration. In our tradition, our aspiration is to, uh, is to really awake, to free ourselves from all our delusions, all our reactivity, all our unwholesome minds, and really, you know, awaken a really healthy and aware mind that really knows itself. And to want to help and benefit all beings, to free them from their own delusions and sufferings. So this, uh, this in, cultivating this enlightened mind is something that one meditates on first. And then, and then the, the last one is really, uh, and there are several others, but uh, it's called refuge. Uh, you know, where do, I, where do I take refuge in this life? What do I trust? Who do I trust? You know, and, and in our society, as you might know, trust <laughs> is a big issue. A lot of people have issues around trust at all levels of society. Uh, the unfortunate thing to follow in any kind of consistency, a spiritual path uh, to experience uh, the fruits of that path, uh, one has to have confidence uh, in the teachings, one has to have confidence in the practices, and one has to have confidence in the teachers who are teaching us, right? So, so in other words, where do I go for refuge in this life? You know, the ups and downs, the uh, confusions, you know, where do I go to refuge? So, so that's, uh, so those are the ordinary, what are called the ordinary preliminaries. And I've gone through them very in a cursory way, but you know, we, we have retreats on this, we have talks on this, uh, we go on and on and on. So last time uh, we got into the special preliminaries. We're still not at the big one yet, but we're, in the, we're still in the preliminaries. And if you remember, well, for those who are here and those who weren't here, just very quickly, the first is a human being. We're all human beings. Outwardly, we are known by our bodies, right? the actions of our bodies. And we are known by our words. Right? That's sort of the seen part of us, the part of us that we can see how, how we relate to the world and how we really see others. You know, we, we, we see their bodies. We have all kinds of ideas about that. And then we, we hear their words. But there's a third part of what makes a human being, which is the mind. Now, the problem with seeing the mind is it's invisible. You can't see the mind and you can't see other people's minds. And yet, and yet, what is it that really controls the actions of our body and our speech? Our body doesn't act by itself. Our words don't come out by themselves. Well, sometimes, unfortunately, they do. Uh, but, but basically, everything is coming from the mind. Our happiness, our sadness, our anger, our love, it's all, these are all mind states. So basically, he says the first thing we have to really be aware of, of body, speech, and mind, that the mind, he, he calls it the king, you know, he, he lived in a feudal society, he called it the, queen, the king, you can call it the queen, or you can just call it the president, or you can call it chief executive officer, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, but to really get the most important thing in my life is, is my mind, the condition of my mind. And you know, in our society, we spend a lot of time taking care of our bodies, making sure our bodies are healthy. And we care a lot about how our, how our bodies look to the world, right? And all, many of us are very careful about our speech or should probably be more careful about our speech. But oftentimes, we, we really are not very attentive to our minds. 
you know, we were not attentive to what's going on in, their, in our mind. But even, I would say worse, we are not attentive to how we need to really care for our minds. The same way we care for our bodies. If our body is not healthy, we, we do things, right? You know, I mean, not only do we do things to relieve the symptoms if our body are problematic, but we even, many of us decide, oh, I want to have a healthier body, right? Oh, I want to have a healthier body. So what do we do? Question? What? We go to the gym. We start exercising. What else do we do? We do yoga. We do other. We do qigong on Wednesdays. We do. All right. So, so we do lots of physical things. What else do we do? What? Eat healthy. So we start paying very close attention to our diet, you know, and, and what we're eating and what we're not eating. All right. You know, so, so, right. And maybe we, maybe we want to change how our bodies look. Right? So we change our hairstyle or we change, <laughs> you know what I mean? We, there's lots of things we, we do in relationship to our bodies. But the idea that I should have even more awareness of my mind and be doing lots of things to, to take better care of my mind, to change my mind, to transform my mind, to cultivate wholesome things in my mind so I, so I have a wholesome mind, that never dawns on most people, does it? And yet, what, what Gangsha is saying, of course, is really, and, and what Buddhism is about is, and that's why meditation is central uh, in the Buddhist path of transformation, is mind is most important. So that's what he's, you know, this is, this is what he's trying to pass on to us as a preliminary. Before we even get to meditation or any kind of transformative thing, do we understand that the mind is the king, the mind is the ruler, and everything in my life comes from my mind and my mind states? Any questions about that before I take him on the next step? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, <laughs> we might, somebody might be thinking, well, isn't that obvious? You know, when you stop and think, of course, it is obvious. But yet, if mind is most important, and I really ask myself, how much attention do I give my mind? How much care do I give my mind? How much do I watch my mind to see whether it's healthy or unhealthy, wholesome or unwholesome? How much time do I really put into, what am I putting into my mind? You know, people are very careful these days about what they eat. Ooh, you know, right? My, you know, I am what I eat, or what did they say, or something like that. You are what you eat or something? It was some kind of thing, you are what you eat. So we understand in terms of our body, the things we consume affect our body in a positive or negative way. And yet in terms of the mind consumption, the things we consume with our mind, we'll throw any kind of garbage in there. I mean, I'll let you decide your own definition of garbage. But, I mean, it's interesting. You know, we're very careful about what we eat these days. And whatnot, but in terms of the mind consumption, you know, I'll just consume anything. What? That's quite true. Yeah, that's quite true. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, so, again, He's, he's, he's setting us up. Can you see? He's getting us to, to think more deeply about something that we would say, oh, that's, of course, that's obvious. But he's saying, well, you know, a, you know, I mean, there's a whole area of medicine called psychosomatic medicine, you know, where people are, you know, you know some, some physicians, med medical people are going, oh, mind states have some effect on body and disease, right? I'm sure you all know of that. Now, what does that mean? Again, it's saying the same thing, that even our mind can not only uh, be, be doing harm, but it can be affecting our bodies. Stress is of the mind. And yet stress, whole body of, of, of you know, good research that shows stress has a very negative effect on the mind. I mean, on the body, and yet it's of the mind. Anger is of the mind. 
it has a very negative effect on the body and contributes to lots of illnesses. You know, f I mean, people who stay in, in constant fear and, and, and fear arousal, this also affects the body, all right? Despair, I mean, so, and of course, mind states affect what we, what we, what we say, <laughs> how we talk to each other, right? I mean, we can do a lot of damage with words. Words that we say to other people, and even, you know, in the secrets of our own mind, the conversations we have with ourselves often are not the most wholesome kind of conversations, are they? So speech, but again, it all comes from the mind. So that was the first. Now, what I got into last time was this uh, thing that uh, Kempo calls uh, distinguishment. And again, this is something that meditators spend a lot of time doing, but I'm following uh, Gangshar's example and just putting it out there. Some of you may be brand new. So first, the thing we need to distinguish is between appearances and perceived objects. Okay. Again, sounds very simple. Okay. What is a perceived object? A perceived object is anything we perceive with our senses. Okay, what do we perceive with our senses? We see things, we see things, right? We hear things, we hear sounds, we see sights, we, we see all kinds of sights, we hear all kinds of sounds, we smell, we taste, we have sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, in our body and touch, right? Is that true? So we have this whole world that we live in of, of our five senses are always perceiving objects. Would everybody agree with me? Okay. So he's calling that perceived objects. Then he says, and it's Tibetan words that are translated, he says, we need to distinguish between perceived objects and appearances. Now, what does he mean by appearances? Appearances are all the stuff that appear in our mind in relationship to the objects. Thoughts, feelings, perceptions, emotions, you know, all the way we filter all the way we interpret, all the way we label the world of perceived objects is all being created by what? Take a, take a wild guess. Where does it all go, right? So this, can everybody see this? This is a perceived object. I feel like I'm in elementary school. This is a perceived object, right? Right? That your mind is aware of. Is that true? Through the organ of seeing. Now, when you see this, what arises in your mind? Just anybody shout it out. Holding it. I'm holding it. He's holding it. He's holding something. And if anything else, what? It's pretty. It's a. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a little white thing. It's a little white vase. It's a. It's a flower. What else could could possibly arise in your mind? It's shiny. It's breakable. Be careful. What? It smells. I wonder how it smells. It's pleasing. I wonder what it's called. That's just for starters, okay? Now, all that labeling, all that filtering of it, all occurred where? Right. Does this call itself a flower? Does this call itself a vase? No. So everything that we could possibly say about this is all arising in, in, it's appearing in our mind. It's not the same as this. 
So we start out very, see, this is no emotional coloration, right? Now, is it, what are the implications of this? Sounds, how about sounds? So we listen, we hear in the meditation hall, we're on Nebraska Avenue and we hear sounds. What sounds may we hear? What, we may hear the wind, trees, traffic, buses, what? Music, sometimes a lot of music. What else, right? Now, for some people, maybe during meditation, when they hear these sounds, just sounds, they may say to themselves, well, some say, oh, it's a bus, it's a car, it's traffic, it's wind, okay? True? We label it. But then somebody may go, hmm. I wish it was quieter here, right? You see, right? See, I wish it was quieter. And if we wished it was quieter, we might get a little disturbed that it's not quiet, or, you know, somebody may go by with loud music and go, ah, we're going, ah, disturbing my meditation. Why do people do these things, right? So inconsiderate, you know, of meditators. Uh, <laughs> and so we may get a little agitated, right? And all that's going on where? Right. The, the bus, the car, the person, it's not coming from there. It's all coming from our mind. Now, these are very simple examples. Just close your eyes a moment. Everybody has a life, right? Everybody has a life here. Well, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, you have a life. You're interacting with people, you're seeing people, you're hearing sounds, you're eating food, you're everything that's going on. Are you just in the thing of itself, just living in the perceived object? Or in relationship to everything that's pretty much going on, are things appearing in your mind? You may live with people and you have all kinds of things appearing in your mind about them, positive and negative. You may have interactions that you find pleasant, that you find unpleasant. Next time you listen or watch whatever you do for the news, notice whether you just read it very objectively or whether all kinds of ideas and feelings and thoughts appear in your mind. We all have childhoods, right? Our childhoods basically what? Things happened. Things bump, 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 things happen, and yet, Many of us, when we think about our childhood, all kinds of things come up, all kinds of stories, all kinds of interpretations, all kinds of feelings. And yet, they're all coming from where? From our minds, not from the actual situation. I mean, I could extrapolate this out and out, but it, it's really as simple as where we started with the vase and the flower. There is a world of perceived objects, a world of sights and sounds and tastes, senses, smells. And then there's the world of how they appear in our mind. And the trouble is they appear the same. How often when we see somebody, even somebody we don't know, do we see them purely, free of anything appearing in our mind, any kind of judgment, any kind of evaluation, any kind of label? The 
this person's a this and that person's a that. I like this one. I don't like that one. I'm comfortable in these. I'm not comfortable with those. I mean, all that's arising where? In our mind, that's the world of appearances. Now, that is, he's not saying, all he's talking about here, please, is saying a fundamental capacity to distinguish, to know the difference. If you think about your emotional life, your life or your mind states, do you really know the difference or do they arise as one? Does the perceived object and what's appearing in our mind seem to us inseparable, the same? Or can we really distinguish there is a world of just perceived objects and then there's the world of my mind that is just projecting filtering endlessly onto it. So this is very fundamental understanding within Buddhist psychology. And the implications of this are quite uh, revolutionary for many people. Can we distinguish between the objective world? See, the objective world we all agree on, right? For most cases, unless we're really disturbed. I mean, most people would agree, right? Whether they're here in the hall, uh, you know, if, if I did the same demonstration in China or India or uh, Uruguay or something, right? Whatever the language is, most people would agree what? It's a vase, it's a flower. I mean, it's a, right, you see, in the world of perceived objects, there is unity, there is commonality. But as soon as we get into what? appearances and how we interpret it and liking and disliking and what they mean and what they don't mean, then we begin to what? Separate ourselves. Now, if we think that the world of our appearances are as real as the world of reality, what happens? Has anybody ever had that happen to them? Where you think something about someone, and because you think your thoughts are absolutely, or your story is absolutely true, you therefore have all kinds of emotionality, and you act out physically or verbally. Has that ever happened to anybody? Is that a rare experience? No. No, why? why? Can you see? How often have you uh, found out, unbelievably, that your interpretation of events may be very different from somebody else's interpretation of events? Has that ever happened to anybody? What? Yes. Even if both people were there at the same time, seeing the same thing, supposedly having the same experience. Has that ever happened to you? That people have radically different, uh, right? How that, how that event appeared in their minds is radically different. How many people were able to distinguish the reality from the story and emotionality that arose in our minds? Think back. How many of us were willing to acknowledge that the other person's story, interpretation, experience 
could be, just for perhaps, as valid as my own. How many people have uh, found that's, yeah, that's easy? I always think everybody else's experience is valid as my own. I always understand that it's just my own experience is just a period in my mind. They're doing the same thing. None of us are probably living in any kind of true consensual reality. Could that possibly be? How well do we really know each other? How well do we really know flowers? Do we see flowers just as they are? Do we see each other just as we are? Or do we see each other, do we project and yet we think our projections are real? He's, she's a bad person. Have you ever thought that about anybody? Yeah. But there's no such thing as a bad person, is there? Not easy, is it? Yeah. That person is just who they are. We're the one who's calling them bad. Is that true? There may be somebody else who doesn't call them bad, and they probably definitely don't call themselves bad. They might even call us bad. I mean, look at war. Isn't war like that? I mean, like two sides looking at the same thing, totally different interpretations of what's going on. Totally different versions of truth. But they're all looking sort of at the same facts, aren't they? But they have totally different interpretations. It's pretty, I mean, I mean, this goes on all the time, from the smallest to, to the biggest. And nobody ever stops to go, maybe my version of, you know what I thought? Maybe my version of the truth. Whew, how dangerous that is. Right, we think we have the truth. Very dangerous. Because when I, when, when I have the truth, then you have what? Yeah, you have untruth. Because I have truth. If I, say, if I have the correct interpretation of what happened, then you, if you don't totally agree with me, then you have to have what? what? Yeah. They're not truth, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, but when I'm into my, um, my version of reality is true, your version of reality is untrue, right? My political stance is true, your political stance is untrue. Sound familiar? I'm good, you're bad. And that, you know, it happens on the playground. And it happens in adult life. And this is what he's talking about. I mean, in a very meditative, introspective way to begin to see this in our own minds. Can I begin to distinguish that there's just an objective reality? In Zen, we, we talk about, what do we talk about in Zen? Right? Like, what did we, what did we practice this morning? Basically, my instructions to you were, let go of all your stories. Stories about the past, stories about the future, stories about what you're doing now, stories about your body, stories about your breath, right? All the stories, and just what? Be present and be aware that you are breathing. Be aware that you're in your body. Feel your sensations. Feel the weight of your body, right? Can you see that's direct experience. But many people, did everybody find that easy to, st to stick with that for 30 minutes? How many found that a piece of cake? How many people found it difficult? Why? What happened? What? Right. It's just the mind is fabricating. Those things are just appearing in your mind, and you're having a hard, hard problem just staying present to reality. The reality is, right now, I'm just sitting here breathing. Let me just relax and just be. 
Does that sound good? We're all very busy, probably, you know? Would anybody just like to spend 30 minutes just relaxing, just being present, just being aware? How's that sound? What, anybody not, not like that idea? That's why we're here, isn't it? And yet notice how difficult even that is. And then we may, may make up a story about it and about ourselves and how we're doing and how our meditation is doing and how it shouldn't do it and how it should be. And maybe everybody else, I'm probably the worst meditator here. And everybody, you know what I mean? It's like, right? Those are just appearing in our mind nonstop. And all that's going on is what? In reality, we're just sitting, right? We're all sitting. Things are appearing, things are disappearing. Any questions about this? I mean, as I say, very simple, this distinguishment, very simple, and yet, just like with that little one about, you know, of, of the body, speech, and mind, mind is the ruler, mind's most important, very simple, but big implications. Any questions online, um, in the hall? Well, just hold on, just want to take questions. Just So let me slow down because people can't. So owning an animal is very good. Right. Okay. So that's. Yeah, yeah. So just good confirmation: a man who, a man and his dog. And his man and his dog, when, his, when the dog is doing what he wants, he calls the dog good. When the dog is not doing what he wants, he calls the dog bad. When, when his dog is doing what is good, he's happy with the dog. When the dog is not doing what he wants, he's unhappy with the dog. And that could be elaborated. But the truth is, the dog is just being a dog. Right? And, and all that is just appearing in your mind. Right? The perceived object is, right now, the dog's barking. If there were a hundred people there, all of very gender, sexual orientations, ethnics, everybody would agree what? The dog is barking. Commonality. Community. Right? Good place to begin. But we begin with what? No. Yeah, nothing wrong with the dog barking. Yes, there is something wrong with the dog. You know? It will be fighting it out about that one. God, I was, I was driving yesterday to St. Pete, 275 traffic, the guy behind me honking me. <laughs> honking me. I mean, it was really incredible. I mean, like I couldn't go anywhere, you know what I mean? Honking me in their cars, you know, all the way lined up. And this poor guy, he's, he's honking me. I see him kind of swerving into the service lane, you know, but he, he's, he's not brave enough to go into it, you know. Coming back, honky. I mean, you can see this whole what? Oh, it's all appearing in his mind. I mean, the reality is what? We're in traffic. It's not moving, you know. Shared experience. We'd all agree, right? I mean, that's an interesting one, right? And yet the personal experience is very different, isn't it? Some people are afraid, oh, I'm going to be late. Some people are angry. This guy was angry. Any, other, any questions? Yes. One question. Uh, Hitler is not bad, question mark? Again, this is not even getting down that road. I mean, that's an extreme example. This is understanding. This is understanding and distinguishing that that man called Hitler did what he did, does what he does, right? The good and the bad is what we arise in our mind. Now, it may be very, I'll, I'll just take somebody, somebody like Hitler. Did anybody at the time that Hitler was alive think Hitler was good? Yes. 
Do people right now think Hitler is good? Yes, right. Okay, is that clear? I mean, that's the truth, you see. That's the truth. Now, what we do with that and how we live in a world where that goes on, well, you know, maybe come to my workshop. <laughs> how to deal with the suffering of the world. But, uh, but that's the truth, yeah. Right, so we have to realize, because if we don't realize it, well, it's very easy to uh, hurt other people. You know, we, have, we, we have to know that we live in a world where people, when people do not share a common assessment of reality, like, I mean, like, isn't that what's happening in our country now, especially with news and social media and people, how they're getting their news? People have their own version of what? What? Of reality. I mean, don't mess with my version of reality. I mean, very dangerous, isn't it? You know, very dangerous when you, when, when you have two people living together who have two different versions of reality. What kind of relationship is that going to be? Harmonious? No, conflict. That's just two people. You know, how about when, when you live in a country or a world where people have different versions of reality which they absolutely believe are true? You know, Thich Nhat Hanh, in his wisdom, said, this is the most dangerous thing of our times. Attachment to views. He put that ahead of killing, which was traditionally in Buddhism, that's the number one. Do not kill, protect life. He said, in this day and age, it's people's attachment to views, their sense of rightness, which is most dangerous. Why did he say that? Because he lived, in, he, he, he lived in a culture, Vietnam, where he saw his community was divided because of views, ideologies. And people killed each other because of views. He went, this is it's a dangerous world we're entering. Right? I mean, that was back in the 60s. He saw what was happening. So, uh, yeah. Are there other questions? Okay, so let me just quickly, again, we'll continue. Moving ahead, and I'm not going, because the, the next section is really is, is more meditative, really understanding the nature of your mind, learning meditation to watch your mind, and really see what thoughts are, what feelings are. Do we really have such a thing as a mind? These kinds of very interesting uh, questions. But then there's one other one, which is, again, very uh, important, which is, a higher level of distinguishment. And this is distinguishing between mind and awareness. Okay. So this is in Buddhism again. So first step is what? Mind, which is now I'm talking about our ordinary mind, right? And perceived objects. Right? The objective world, the world, you know, we need to distinguish they're not the same. Okay. Now, the next thing to distinguish is, and we can all do that, is so. If you look at this, or if this is, for those uh, online, if this is too small, if you just look at this or whatever is appearing on your screen or whatever is appearing, okay. So when we're looking at this, this is our, the perceived object. Is that true? Okay. All of this is, your, is perceived object. In other words, this is what you're perceiving. I'm perceiving you. You're perceiving me. The next step is, so there is the world between the object and appearances, but then the next step is, what is it 
that is perceiving? What is it? What is this awareness that just sees things as they are, without any coloration, without any distinguishment at all? So the next thing to notice, this is like a deep step, is that fundamental is this the fact that all beings are just aware. So for a moment, just kind of be aware that all that's going on in this moment is that you are aware. You can be aware of this object. You can be aware of the sound of my voice. You can be aware of sensations in your body. You can be aware that thoughts are arising and passing. But all of that is appearing in one thing, which is your fundamental awareness. So even the world of how things appear, the world of perceived objects, are appearing because fundamentally, all of us, by the nature of our minds, are simply, we're aware. And seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, are all arising, we can be aware of all that, can't we? We can be aware of sights. We can be aware of sounds. We can be aware of taste and touch. We can be aware of our thoughts, can't we? So the world of perceived objects, again, is just endlessly, endlessly, endlessly multitudinous, endlessly, it's myriad, it's endless. Sights and sounds and smells and tastes and thoughts, right? How many thoughts do you think you can have in a day? I forget, Alex once told me. How many thoughts is a person? They've, somebody's actually documented this. What? Was it 80 something thousand? Right, I mean, that's how researchers spend their time. Uh, right, so in a day we have 80,000 thoughts coming and going, and they all appear in what? In our, in our awareness. Our awareness is what's always here. Sights endlessly changing, sounds endlessly changing, tastes endlessly changing, right? How many different things do you taste in a day? Endlessly changing. And yet the awareness, that which is aware, is always here, always present. So the next thing is distinguish, there is something that is always here, that is always present, that is always functioning, and it is our natural awareness. And it has, it's very interesting, because if, so just close your eyes, and simply, Look into your mind, whatever, whatever that means to you. And notice that, you know, you may be aware of whatever you're aware of. And if you just for a moment can look directly into that awareness, that within each of us that is aware, can feel a little disoriented because we're always lost in the thoughts or in the perceived objects. But if just for a moment, for want of a better word, you become aware of this awareness, this fundamental awareness that's just here. Like a mirror that just reflects sounds and sights and smells and tastes and thoughts, all that are arising, but they're all just arising and passing in our awareness. 
does this awareness have any uh, characteristics? Is this awareness uh, male or female? Does this awareness have a gender, a sexual orientation? Does this awareness have any kind of uh, ethnic racial identity at all? This fundamental awareness? Are there any issues, any problems? And we're just simply aware. Anything to be added, anything to be taken away? Or is it very relaxing to just rest in awareness, even for 10 seconds for a minute. Just to put everything down and just notice simply, fundamentally, the light of awareness is always on. And it is not the same as all the things that it is lighting up. So the world of thoughts, the world of perceived objects, the world of appearances, they're all impermanent, aren't they? Thoughts, feelings, perceptions, mind states, emotional states, memories, sights, sounds, they're just endlessly arising and passing. From the moment we get up to the moment we go to sleep, from our birth to our, to our death, but it's nice to know there is something right here that is very open, free, and it's our, it's our birthright. So again, this, uh, this exploration, this distinguishment is something, again, that it takes time to really get. It's really kind of a function of meditative exploration of the mind. But it can produce a very uh, significant shift. In what way? Well, if you think about what our mind is grasping at all day, what's, what it's holding on to, our obsessions, our ruminations, our traumas, all these things that are appearing in the mind that we just treat as real, and it affects us. Our relationships, our health, our well-being. So this is not kind of just like deep stuff, you see what I'm saying? This is like real. Any, any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, hold on. David has the mic. Tell me. This is a very open question. <laughs> so I'm sitting here with the awareness exercise and I have all these senses. So I don't have very many smells right here, but okay. I'm feeling this and I'm hearing that. Mm -hmm. People move a tiniest bit and mm -hmm. kind of hear that and mm -hmm. almost feel the energy of the room. Mm -hmm. And I immediately become very overwhelmed because to be aware of all of this and know how many other things there are to be aware of, I just, I don't know how to mentally accept. And then, you know, hearing this 80,000 thoughts, like I can't be aware of all those thoughts. I can't even remember to buy the milk <laughs> half the time. So. Yeah. I, I just feel overwhelmed and 
I don't know if there's any kind yeah. of So that's, that's a good, very good. Why do you get overwhelmed? Well, there's another whole piece of, of Dharma that is not being talked about today, which is this sense of self of me or mine, which is also big. So Tammy's sitting there following the instructions. She's open. You said this is an open question. She's open. Her senses are open. She's just kind of just letting things be. Right? Sound, sight, smells, right? Thoughts coming and going. All of that is happening in the now. Not in the past, not in the present. It's just happening now. All you need to do is attend to what's arising now. But then, Tammy's open peace is disturbed with the thought, Oh my God, I can't do this. 84,000 thoughts in a day, or I have, you know, so much in... That's just a thought. That's just another thought. Coming in to close you. This is easy. You don't have to do anything for this, right? So right now, Tammy, do you see me? Can you hear me? Are you aware that your hands are uh, holding up your chin? Is that overwhelming? Yeah, I know, but just, then just let that come through. You see, what's, you know, what's, you know what I mean? So that's good. So what's going on? Why? Because as I said, practically, right? All that's going on right now is what? You and I are doing this together. <laughs> and yet, something appears in the mind. I mean, it's... My quest is to be the best person that I can be. Yes. So I don't come here to, to, to be here for five minutes. I come here to, to get what I can get and yes. make me better. And if I'm overwhelmed here and there's okay. so little that I have to be responsible for, I can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is not about, yeah, I hear you. This is, this is not about any of that, okay? This is about, okay. Do you, do you enjoy, uh, taking a bath or a shower. I'm, I'm just making that up. I don't know. Or, or, or whatever. Or do you enjoy, all right. Let's say you, you know, that was like, you know, you love to take a bath, right? It's just very relaxing. All right. Are you going to spend your whole day in the bathtub? No. So this is knowing, knowing that there is this fundamental awareness that we can just relax into. It's always here. It's very nourishing because we can let go of all that, your responsibilities. Is that clear? So, so you know what I'm saying? We're, we're kind of going in a certain very inward direction to nourish ourselves, right? Okay. So we can relax and nourish ourselves with the fundamental awareness of our mind. But then coming out, those other distinguishments are important that we talked about earlier knowing that, that all Tammy's doing all day, and I, I know she's a busy woman with lots of responsibility, is she's just doing one thing after the other, right? That's all you're doing all day, right? And if you could do all the things you need to do during the day, which I know are a lot, with a very free mind that just takes care of business all day long, you're just taking care of business, right? And you're not letting any of the emotionality, any of the holding on, any of the ruminating, obsessing at all in your mind. You're just dealing with whatever, dealing with work, dealing with the kids, dealing with the husband, you know, dealing, right? Dealing with the family, you're just dealing with them. That's not overwhelming. It's overwhelming when we step back and we think about all we're doing or all we need to do. That's what overwhelms us, right? Every day, Tammy, and I'm, I'm, I'm not in your home, so I have no idea what you do every day, but every day, all day, what do you do? You just take care of business. Isn't that what you do? That's all you do. And at the end of the day, what do you do? You go to sleep. And hopefully you have a good night's sleep. And then you wake up in the morning, what do you do? Take care of business. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way to live. 
if we can distinguish between that, right, and all the stuff that arises in my mind about that. Those are the appearances. You know, having a to-do list that's, you know, of 200 items, yeah, that can be overwhelming. But you know what? If you just took care of one of those items at a time, bum, this one finished, then on to the next, that's not overwhelming. Okay? That's not overwhelming. But we have to learn to stay really present. Take care of one thing at a time. 100 things to do, one at a time. Living in the here and now is a very effective way to live. Very productive way to live. So it's good to be able to distinguish between just perceived reality and the stuff that appears in our mind about reality. Okay? Does that make it a little clearer? Yeah, and the, you know, You know, this is a very, <laughs> I often joke with people, you know, when you get together with your family at Thanksgiving, they don't talk about these kind of issues, do they? <laughs> right, right. You know, if you still go to the lunchroom at work, is this what they talk about? You know, have you heard this interesting talk about distinguishing mind from, I mean, is that what you're going to talk about on Monday morning? No? All right. So, you know, so this is very different, isn't it? And the fact that it's bringing something up, yeah, it's, yeah, this is, this is, very different than, than, than the way we traditionally operate is, and I, I get it. No hurry. Okay. So on that note, I will stop. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>